this is coming up. And, and I have uh, in my hot little hand a couple sign-up sheets for this. What this is, let me explain kind of what, what this is a little bit more. Um, one of the things that we talked about in our long-range planning was how teaching, teaching, and teaching the Bible, studying the Bible, learning the scriptures is such a such a part of our life together as a congregation. That was one of the things that struck me when I came here five years ago, and it is still very much true that we have um, that we have so many different opportunities to study the scriptures, both for adults and for children. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to kind of strengthen our, our teaching. And so what we're doing is, probably twice a year, I'm going to do a seminar on a Saturday morning, and we're going to start with just doing the, the six parts of the catechism. So this one we'll do the creed, uh, the Apostles' Creed, and we're going to look at the doctrine of the Apostles' Creed, and especially how that shapes how we teach the faith and how we speak the faith to other people. So this has to do not only with teaching, but I would also say with evangelism and outreach. Uh, one of the common common things that I hear about uh, about evangelism and outreach is, is a very, I don't know what to say. Well, that is something that we can actually uh, study and learn and recognize God's promises for us along the way. So this is uh, 9 to noon on that uh, on that Saturday morning, so it's a couple weeks from now, I've got a couple sign-up sheets here. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking this, first of all, for parents who are the primary teachers in the church, but also for anyone who teaches Sunday school, adult Bible classes, um, in any other in any other context as well. I would encourage you to try and join us for that. Thanks for that. Levi. Will that be recorded? I hope so. I am planning on it and desiring to <coughs> Any other questions or thoughts on that? All right. Thank you. On that Sunday, the 13th, so not next Sunday, but the Sunday after, um, our deaconess is going to do a presentation on her recent COVID uh, trip. So we'll, uh, we'll take a pause on our liturgy study for that, for that Sunday. Thank you. All right, let's let's get back to what we are doing. Okay, so this uh, uh, so this morning we're going to look at we we mostly looked at liturgy and worship in the early church, and we started to look a little bit in the medieval church. So here we're going to look at kind of what Luther did with the liturgy and kind of how that has traced through uh, to today. Um, so just a couple questions to get us back to what we were talking about last week. Number one, why were these parts in between the word and sacrament put in place originally? You remember in Dr. Just, uh, kind of his, his line and the structures, you have those two big squares of word and sacrament, and there, and there were a bunch of little kind of buffer things in between. What were they? For movement. Yes, exactly. They were for movement. As the church got got larger, there became a need to have kind of a movement space. Um, uh, one example would be would be a procession. We did a procession this morning, and that originally would have been if we didn't have pews and everybody's kind of milling around, there would be no easy, obvious way for people to get through. Uh, so you put a cross on a stick, and that kind of allows people to go in and through. Now, what's interesting and a little tricky about those kind of things for us today is, I don't need a cross on a stick in order to get through, right? <laughs> don't need it. Um, and, so, and so it's now serving a, a liturgical function that is, that is not practical in the sense that we don't need it. So that's always kind of the question of why do we do these things and at what point are they beneficial and not beneficial and such. I think that that still has a lot of benefit and we can learn a, quite a bit about movement in the liturgy. Um, but that's kind of where those came from. So how does that shape our use of these parts of the liturgy today? 
we started to answer that a little bit, or I started to answer that a little bit. Um, when we talk about liturgy today, I think it's very easy for us to uh, think of the liturgy as the bulletin. You know, this is the thing that's the piece of paper that you get. That's the liturgy. Um, that's kind of like saying the sermon is the piece of paper on on the pulpit. Well, no, that's the piece of paper on the pulpit. The sermon is what you hear. And in the same way, the liturgy is what you hear and receive and do. And it's not simply a piece of paper. Now we'll, we'll talk about that distinction a little bit more along the way. Any other any questions or thoughts from last week? All right. Everybody get a hand up. In the year 410, the barbarians from the north invaded and began to wreak havoc in the Roman Empire. Now, perhaps from your study... You're, um, if you'll pardon the expression, you're Susie Pew-sitter. 
<laughs> in the Middle Ages. And, and you see some guy up there. And you're twiddling your thumbs. And you're trying to figure out where, how, where's God in all of this? How do I worship God when all of this stuff's going on that I, I don't even know what it is, far less. And, and you also have a big language gap that starts to happen because all of this stuff's happening in Latin. And less and less of the people uh, know any Latin. So you have a language barrier going on. You've got physical distance going on. If you've ever um, uh, been to one of these big cathedrals in, in Europe, you know, you've got this high altar, and then way far away is where the people sit. <laughs> so you're going to be 50, 75 feet away from the front plate, the very first place where people are standing. Remember, there were no pews at this time. So you find developing at this point um, a lot of other things that happen in order to, I would say, to uh, keep the focus and the piety of the people on, on Christ and the worship. So one, one really obvious example of that uh, is the rosary. Um, now, Mary is a bit the kind of the, the cult of Mary and everything like that is a slightly different question. But what the rosary was there for was so that the people would have a way of focusing their prayers and worship. That was a good thing, not a bad thing. Now, it sort of turns into something else later on. But but you had a lot of these kind of very personal pieties and things that sort of developed during this time because they have nothing to do with what's going on in church, or very little. Um, then when Luther comes in, uh, he restores these things to the congregations, which means a, a bunch of work, first of all. He's got to teach all of this stuff to the congregations because They've been solving this stuff for hundreds of years. They don't know these things. How does Luther do it? Children. He teaches, he has them taught to the children who then teach it to their parents. Very, very simple. That's how they learned the liturgy. They learned it from their children. And then, the second thing he does, and then I know that there are a couple of hands here. The second thing he does is he makes a... Um, it's almost a paraphrase or a commentary on, on the liturgy in the vernacular, in German. And that's where we get all of these hymns that we're, that we're learning. I say, I'm going to see here this creed hymn, the Kyrie that we're singing with the choir. All of those things were these sort of commentaries or paraphrases in that, that Luther did in German in order to teach the people kind of what what these mean. Initially, I don't think that they were meant to replace, but in, replace the uh, the Latin, but that very often did happen at the end of the day. Now, there were a couple hands. Mary and then Catherine. Oh, way back. Well, okay. this popped in my head. We didn't happen to know when the church is actually started printing bulletins. Oh. Fifties. <laughs> 1950s, I'm going to say. Probably with the rise of that newfangled, highly technical device called an Indian graph. Well, I'm going to guess. I was going through some old trunks in my family. My mother had saved certain services from about 20s and 30s. Yeah. So and, I've seen, and I've seen yeah. some of those, so, but were those weekly services or were they special services? Because well, I've definitely I've seen, seen bulletins from, you know, a Reformation service in the 20s. Interesting. Because a normal congregation would not have had the means or the ability to print those. I don't think bulletins, kind of on a week-to-week -week basis, become normal until uh, until at least the 50s, if not later. Because what you had was, you know, you think of the old, old hymnal, TLH. Old hymnal or old, old? 
very much in church because it's kind of for somebody else, frankly. And so you want to grasp onto anything that you can actually grasp. And so if you can grasp the host, then you have something to focus on. And that, and that, that you can actually see and touch and taste, etc. And so I can I can recognize the the why that would happen, why that piety would happen. What that forgets, of course, is that Jesus says, take, eat, take, drink. He doesn't say, take home. <laughs> I mean, that's just not what he says. That's not what the word says. <laughs> so, um, so it's a misapplication. Um, but at least initially, I would say there's, there's probably some good instinct behind it. I am much more comfortable with people being overly reverent with our Lord's body and blood than being flippant about it. I guess that was the thing. I was thinking, like, if, if the wine did spill, I would right. want to right. rush. And, and, and so let's, yeah. let's take a very practical example. What would happen at our church if, if there is a spill on Sunday morning? Which doesn't happen very often, but, has, but happens occasionally when you're talking about people and you know, all of these little glasses and cups of stuff, you know, things spill sometimes. Um, what would happen is, is that I would would take a purificator, which which is the napkin, and I would and I would wipe it up. And that's what I would do. I would do it reverently and carefully, but not, you know, we wouldn't burn the carpet or you know, or do something or do something else like that, but that we would treat it carefully and reverently. And simply, you know, the same would be, you know, if some, if uh, if a host gets dropped, for example, there's another good example, because um, that will occasionally happen. If a if a host is dropped when I am distributing, what I will do in that case is I will pick it up and I'll hold on to it until after I'm done distributing the table, and then I'll consume it because uh, I don't want to throw away our Lord's body. Um, and I don't want to kind of get into a, well, when does it stop being our Lord's body? I don't know. The Bible doesn't actually answer that question, and so I would rather not um, speculate on it. And so I will consume it afterwards. Just very practically, that's how I that's that's how I would handle that. And that's the sort of thing where I would say, as a congregation, we want to look at those questions and say, what is um what is reverence and what is reason? And what what is what is it that we can do that is going to be appropriate? Rick, I was quite surprised to hear him say that putting it in your hand predated. I know, so isn't that crazy? Now. Yeah, we you think, think of just the opposite. Yeah, and for us, and well, and the reason is because we are a part of the Western Church, and by Luther's day. Everybody received orally. Everybody received it. That was the only way you received communion. And because you know this has been a d decree from the Pope from 125 years before, and in Lutheranism that absolutely kind of stayed in place. I'm going to say till the 1950s or 60s for sure, probably the 60s. So, so you can say receiving by the hand. Is the older practice, but you know, by by which I mean, you know, fourth century, but receiving orally has been kind of the more the more recent practice, and is what has generally been done for the last five hundred years. And that and that's why um, what I will what I urge people, and I and I will talk to when I'm teaching confirmants or new members about stuff like that. What I will suggest is um, is that they're that whatever you're doing, uh, do so reverently to the glory of God. Pick one, and I would suggest do it the same way as a family, because that seems like a reasonable and good idea. But it's not it's not a law, and I don't think that there is a right or wrong there. Jesus said, right. Well, it doesn't say pass around. I mean, once again, there we have a, there we get into this. What does he say? He says, take, eat. 
but it doesn't say pass around. Well, I, that's a great question. Especially if they were all sitting on the other side. Right. Well, and, and this is and, and this is this is kind of why do you see all of the pictures with everyone on one side of the table? Well, first of all, you don't want to see people's backs in the picture. But more practically, is that that is the way that meals were served with servants, and so the servants would would serve the table, and then and then uh, there and this is why I would. I would argue that a good answer to that would be Jesus is actually getting up and serving them. And he's already done the whole foot washing thing. He's already demonstrated that I am that he is their servant and not simply their their lord and master. But the text doesn't say. It. And so I think we can we can make some pious speculation there. But I don't want to. I don't want to go beyond what the text actually says. Barbara. About the liturgy, and the amazing thing about the liturgy is that it's universal. Yeah. Um, although Luther. You have a reasonably good idea of what's going on. Yeah, it is. Um, one one uh, last thing on that, and that is that in the 1960s in the Roman Catholic Church, there was a, uh, a church council called the Second Vatican Council, Vatican II. And that would be an, a very interesting thing to, to look at sometimes because that actually has had a lot of implications for us as Lutherans. But a part of what Vatican II did was, and, and they probably would not put it this way, but what a lot of what Vatican did was implement many of the liturgical forms that Luther had done 450 years before. Like the language and the vernacular, Getting, getting rid of a lot of the a, a lot of the kind of secondary little things. Uh, the priest now faces the people, uh, and there's a lot of things that that happened in Vatican II that were very very closely aligned with what Luther had done 450 years before. So just food for thought. All right, we're going to take a quick look at church, and then we will be done. Seth, could you hit the light for me? Any of you ever been to Lutheran Church of Our Savior yes. in Cupertino? A few people. Beautiful, beautiful uh, church uh, built, I believe, in the 1960s. Um, yeah, it has a real, uh, a real interesting use of light. Obviously, the kind of the prominent thing as you're looking forward is this uh, uh, is this this great big. Uh, Mosaic. It's not a. It's not of a person, but you can see it. It's behind the behind the cross there. Here's a little bit, a little bit closer. It's kind of hard to photograph, frankly, because it, uh, it's so bright there. It gets washed out. Um, but the the reason I wanted to want to, and this is all a very kind of straightforward uh, and simple, simple sanctuary, with one exception that I think is worth pointing out. On the left there, right? There we go. Right here is the baptismal font. Okay? And so they have what basically functions as a baptistry off on the side here. And this is where you really get these amazing, amazing stained glass windows that are on the sides of the church. And that's really what I wanted you to see in this uh, in these pictures. And notice some of the some of the things in this uh, font. It looks circular, but it also has kind of an octagonal view to it at the same time. You've got some really interesting kind of carved pieces there. There's a shell. There's you can't see it in this picture, but that's John baptizing Jesus. So you've got some some interesting things in there and some lovely uh, light coming in with this stained glass window 
on the side there. There's a lot, um, we can spend a long time looking at their, uh, at their stained glass windows because they really are remarkable. But um, again, this is probably my favorite at the bottom. I don't know if you can read it. Come unto me, all you that, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you, I will give you rest. So that's a really nice uh, use of stained glass that teaches. Yeah, they're quite, they're quite beautiful. I, I think they did a wonderful, wonderful job with that. All right, friends. Next week we will look a little bit more at the church year um, and kind of how how the liturgical year works. And with that, let's close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Um,